Okay, I'm going to start. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Welcome to this session of the London Financial Regulation Seminar. And I am delighted to introduce today my colleague in the US, Professor Art Wilmar, who will be talking about his latest book, Taming the Mega, Me Mega Banks, but this is not a book presentation. He will be framing the discussion around the issues of separation between banking and securities and banking and commerce. Issues that were very important in the 1930s with the New Deal legislation in response to the, the, the stock market crash and ensuing banking crisis that engulfed the US for quite a few years in the 1930s, including after the passage of, of the Glass-Steagall Act. And the episode that we call the global financial crisis, there have been several global financial crises, but we talk about the GFC or global financial crisis as the, the, the most recent one that started really in 2007, but reached its peak in 2008 with the collapse of Lehman Brothers. Both periods have a similarity in that somehow the separation between banking and securities, between commercial banks and investment banks, was released and in the 1930s completely and in the 1990s a little bit more partially through some other legal arrangements through a piece of legislation that he will refer to in the US in 1999. The issues are very important because not only because his book is great, I have to say that ever since I work at the IMF almost three decades ago, the issues of design of the banking system have uh, interested me a lot because I remember having discussions in the setup of the, of, of the advice that the IMF gave to the newly independent republics in the former Soviet Union as to which banking system they should adopt or they should look into. One that would develop a diversified financial system or one that will be bankified or bank dominated. And these are important issues now when fintech and the definition of what is a bank and what are the banking uh, functions, banking activities, or again at the top of the agenda in the US, in China, in the EU. And therefore, I'm delighted that he agreed to join us because I think the issues are very important. I think his book, Taming the Mega, Mega Banks, and I encourage all of you, if you haven't got a copy already, to get one is really timely and important in the like of the rise and rise and rise and rise of fintech, but also because there is an underlying discussion between the traditional themes of financial regulation and some of the innovation that sometimes can't make us think that the issues are new. And as we will discuss in before uh, we join with the rest of you, Nil novum sub soli. There is very little new under the sun. So the issues tend and the crisis tend to come back if we somehow release on the fundamentals. And he's going to go back to some of those fundamentals as well as bringing the debate to the current situation nowadays, mostly with emphasis in the US, but the issues are also applicable to other jurisdictions. So without further ado, I'm thanking Art very much for sharing his time with us today from Washington. We live in Zoomland, so Zoomland allows us to connect from wherever we are. That's at least one of the benefits of technology. And uh, that how we will do it is as, as we always do in this London Financial Regulation Seminar. First, uh, Professor Wilmar, we talk for around 30 minutes, and then we will have a discussion. The discussion is rather informal. There is no set discussant. We wanted to have it like that to allow for maximum interaction. So you can either ask questions directly by raising your hand in the hand feature, or just even physically if you show your camera to me, or by writing in the chat room. And then we will aim to finish around six o'clock. So without further ado, I will mute myself and I encourage everyone to mute themselves. Though you can keep your camera on, it's always nice to see people, even if it's just the images of people. And I will give the, the floor to, to Professor Wilmarth, who is now Professor Emeritus of Law at George Washington University Law School and has a most distinguished career in the field of banking and finance from the legal perspective and some of the most influential ratings in the field. And he has also taught many of my most dear friends in the U.S., for which I'm very grateful. Thank you and welcome. 
Rosa, thank you very much. I, it's a great pleasure to be with you today and to talk about my book and uh, how it relates to, I think, uh, issues um, that we're now confronting today uh, with fintech and uh, also, I would say, uh, the continued rise of global debt levels, uh, it, to me, to very alarming levels. Um, there's an old saying, uh, sometimes attributed to Mark Twain, although it hasn't been totally verified, uh, that history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And uh, as I studied uh, the Great Depression and then uh, obviously witnessed the onset of the global financial crisis, it seemed to me that there were very strong rhyming characteristics between these two really catastrophic events, uh, not only in the U.S., uh, where both crises started, but, uh, but certainly globally and particularly uh, in, 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 uh, in, in Europe. So uh, as, as Rosa mentioned, uh, banks had historically been separated from the securities markets in the United States, uh, but then gradually they became uh, involved in securities activities beginning as early as about 1880, but really accelerating uh, after, between World War I uh, and, and, and uh, the stock market crash of 1929. So. Uh, they began by partnering uh, with uh, leading investment banks, as securities firms were called in those days, uh, J.P. Morgan and Company, uh, Kuhn Loeb and Company. They, they, they sort of participated in underwriting syndicates for bonds. And then in the early 1900s, uh, the federal authorities came in and said, uh, banks, you really can't be doing this kind of bond underwriting business. Uh, the National Bank Act doesn't allow it. Um, and banks then began shifting uh, into what were called securities affiliates. These were uh, state chartered companies that were controlled by the national banks and indeed some large state banks, but the largest banks were mostly all national banks. They were commonly controlled companies, but they were technically separate entities. There was a lot of controversy about their legality, but they were allowed uh, to exist and to grow. Uh, Banks and investment banks were very much involved in underwriting uh, bonds during World War I, first for the Allied governments before the United States entered the war, and then very much uh, for the United States government. Uh, banks became very successful in doing that business, um, and they, they, they realized, oh, you know, now we've won trust with uh, ordinary people in selling bonds. Now we can uh, sell corporate bonds uh, and uh, state, local, and foreign government bonds. And so there was a huge uh, explosion of underwriting in the 1920s, first in the bond market, uh, importantly in the foreign bond market, which included countries like Germany, uh, Hungary, Austria, other Eastern European countries that were struggling to recover after World War I, and then particularly in, in Latin America. And uh, also, of very risky corporate bonds in the United States. And uh, what banks, of course, could do was uh, originate these loans, package them up into bonds, put their imprimatur on them. Uh, they advertise, look, you know, we're experts in this business. We know what we're doing. Uh, you know, we wouldn't steer you wrong. Uh, we'll sell you these bonds uh, and, and, and they have superior yields. I mean, you'll earn a lot more on these bonds than you would uh, investing in U.S. government bonds, uh, and uh, of course they had large uh, numbers of their own depositors. Um, they had uh, connections to smaller banks and insurance companies, so that they, they stuffed the portfolios of these smaller institutions full of the bonds they were underwriting. And then toward the end of the 1920s, they got involved in stocks. Uh, once bonds uh, were being actively marketed, they moved on to stocks, and of course many of these were um, also very risky. You, so you had this enormous financing boom that happened in the 1920s, particularly in the United States, but uh, the United States was also underwriting a lot of the um, spending, uh, particularly in, in Central and Eastern Europe and Latin America at the same time. Uh, and then uh, the, the Fed stood by, but then ultimately began to raise interest rates to, to sort of control this boom. Um, and then uh, it all came to a crashing halt in 1929. Uh, the stock market crashed first. That caused many investors to pull back. Um, many uh, companies, 
governments began defaulting on their bonds. Um, and then, of course, as, as bonds and investments defaulted, uh, people uh, pulled back on, on spending. Uh, corporations began to fail. People began to default on their mortgages. Uh, you had a real estate, both commercial real estate and, and residential real estate collapse that followed the stock market collapse. Catastrophic uh, economic collapse in the 1930s, which spread to Europe in 1931, um, affecting Britain, uh, but particularly affecting countries like Germany, Austria, Hungary, Italy, so on, Belgium, uh, reverberating back to the United States. By 1933, the entire banking system collapsed. Uh, when Franklin Roosevelt took office, the entire banking system was closed for more than a week. Um, as Congress looked at what had happened, they they very much determined that the involvement of banks in the securities markets had led to this unsustainable, uh, reckless financing boom, a credit boom that, that basically overextended both the household sector uh, and the corporate sector and many sovereign uh, borrowers around the world. Uh, and then when everything collapsed, of course, it reverberated back on, on, the, on the financial system uh, many of the smaller banks and the insurance companies that had invested in these securities were wiped out. Of course, many people were wiped out. And so Congress said, uh, we must stop this from happening again. And they passed something called the Glass-Steagall Act. The Glass-Steagall Act um, had three major provisions that, that are of interest to us. First, it, it, it created uh, a federal deposit insurance system so that people's uh, savings in banks would be safe. Uh, they didn't want people's money to be frozen in banks uh, as, it, as, it, as they were uh, in the 1930s. Um, of course, that meant more federal regulation of banks to make sure that they were uh, uh, sound. Secondly, uh, banks were not allowed to engage in any underwriting or dealing in securities except for government bonds. They understood that uh, the governments would need banks to do their uh, funding operations. So except for except for government bonds, uh, no, no underwriting or trading in securities. And, and thirdly, they, they wanted to keep securities firms and other non-banks out of the banking business. So they made it a criminal violation and prohibition uh, for non-banks or securities firms to offer deposits. Um, now the term deposits wasn't very well defined, but, but everybody sort of knew what it was. I mean, the, the deposits were understood to be, you know, money placed for safekeeping um, with a promise that you would get it back uh, at 100% of par, 100% of face value. Uh, and basically only banks were allowed to do that business. Now the Glass-Steagall Act uh, re remained very successful uh, into the 1980s. Yes, there were problems. Uh, certainly um, there, there was inflation beginning in the late 1960s and in 1970s. Uh, you had the collapse of the fixed rate exchange system set up by Bretton Woods in the early 1970s. So there were certainly problems during this period, um, but there was no systemic crisis that engulfed the entire financial system. And a very interesting episode is the collapse of the stock market, the stock market crash of October 1987. When that happened, um, it didn't affect the banks because they weren't involved in underwriting or dealing in securities. What the, what the Fed did was to open the discount window to the banks and to tell the banks, look, um, we want you to make loans to the securities firms to allow them to survive. And so the, the Fed opened the discount window, the banks took out loans from the Fed and, and, and made that credit available to the securities firms. And although many smaller securities firms actually went under, uh, between 1987 and the early 1990s, the large ones survived. Um, and, and that was because of the credit they got from the banks. The banks were not implicated. The banks were not undermined. Now compare that to what happened uh, after Lehman uh, was allowed to fail in September 2008. There was a complete freeze up and panic uh, in, in, in the securities markets. Uh, of course, things had been going bad for about a year before Lehman collapsed, but essentially uh, the banks were completely connected to the securities markets for reasons we'll discuss. They were completely exposed. And so immediately the, the big banks were, the, who were already weakened were in, in tremendous trouble. And essentially the government had to bail out everybody. 
that was also true in Europe, uh, where uh, essentially the, Europe, the, the, uh, the second banking directive of 1992 allowed universal banking in Europe, and uh, the EU and the UK were forced to bail out many of the large uh, universal banks uh, on your side of the Atlantic. So what happened in the United States? Why were banks so exposed in 2008? Well, as my book uh, explains uh, in chapter seven and eight particularly, um, we, we essentially forgot the lessons of history. And beginning in the 1980s, uh, the big banks began arguing, look, you know, we're, we're not making enough money, uh, we're too constrained, uh, let us into the securities markets again. And they've made the argument, Congress didn't know what it was doing back in 1933. That was all a myth that what happened. Uh, th those stories aren't true. Uh, let us back in. And so uh, the regulators were in favor of doing that. Uh, and so during the 1980s and, and through most much of the 1990s, you had a series of regulatory orders, uh, which were upheld by the courts, uh, opening loopholes of various types. And so gradually, uh, banks became more and more involved in the securities markets. By 1996, they were pretty deeply in. And then in 1999, Congress repeals the Glass-Steagall Act uh, and, and basically opens the door fully to universal banking in the United States. As I say, Europe had done it uh, earlier in the second banking directive, and, and, and in many ways, England had done it even earlier in, uh, with the great big bang reforms of 1986, which allowed banks to, to, to buy merchant banks uh, in the London market. Uh, so th what's interesting is as soon as they did that, you know, uh, as soon as they opened the door again uh, in the late 1980s through the late 1990s, the same thing began happening that we saw in the 1920s. Banks got into the securities markets, they took a lot of high-risk debt, packaged it up into bonds, sold it around the world, uh, created another enormous credit boom, uh, possibly even really larger than the one of the 1920s, as I'm about to show you. Uh, and that credit boom was just as risky, just as unstable, uh, just as, as unsustainable. And it blew up in, in 2007 uh, when the housing market began uh, to show serious signs of trouble. As soon as, as soon as the housing market essentially couldn't absorb any more subprime loans uh, and people began to default on their subprime loans because they couldn't refinance them, you had the same uh, sort of cascade, cascading effect, domino effect that, that, that uh, led to progressive collapse of, of financial markets and then the real estate market, you know, first in the United States and then around the world. Uh, I'm going to pull up a couple of PowerPoint slides here for you. Um, okay. Okay. This th this first slide uh, shows at the bottom the two great credit booms that occurred in the United States in the 1920s. It shows just a little bit at the end of the 1920s, and then more dramatically the credit boom uh, that, that followed uh, the, the beginning of deregulation in the 1980s. And 1987 is actually an interesting date because that's the date of the first major uh, opening of loopholes that allowed uh, banks to securitize uh, home mortgage loans and other loans. Um, and you see that uh, there was a peak of about 250% of, of, this is private sector debt, uh, not, not uh, 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 private sector debt to, to GDP, um, and uh, this does not include government debt. Then you see that, that that boom obviously disappeared after the Great Depression. Then you have credit very slowly growing during the post-war period until you get to the 1980s, and then as, as the banking is deregulated, the credit uh, begins to rise substantially. Uh, look, you can see particularly in the household and financial sectors, uh, credit is, is exploding. And by the time you get to 2007, uh, the peak is at about 290% of GDP. Now look at the, I'm sorry, look at the top panel, which is the UK. Um, the UK had no similar credit boom during the 1920s because at that time, uh, more by custom than by law, uh, banks were very strictly separated from the, from the securities markets. They were not allowed, uh, you know, the clearing banks were not allowed to be involved with merchant banks or to own them. 
Um, and so you had no credit boom in the United Kingdom during the 1920s. And although there was a depression, it, it wasn't nearly as severe as it was either in the United States or in Europe because they had no universal banks. Then look at 1987, the, the big bank has just occurred. Um, and there's an enormous increase in all sorts of private sector debt uh, in the United Kingdom. Again, uh, particularly in the financial sector. By the time you get to 2007, it, it exceeds 400% of GDP. So actually Britain had even a larger boom than the United States had in, in the 19, late 1980s to 2007, that 20 year period. And in many ways, the, the global financial crisis was even more severe in Britain, in my opinion, than it was in the United States, although it was terrible in the United States. But essentially four of your nine largest uh, financial institutions had to be bailed out. Uh, and, and all of you know better than I uh, how much uh, your country suffered uh, from that episode. But uh, again, the connection between universal banking and credit booms is really, in my view, remarkable and, and, and uh, um, you know, un, 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 not debatable, uh, although many do debate it. So why do universal banks you know, create these credit booms? Uh, I would say, why are they dangerous? I would say four reasons. First, uh, as we discussed, they can take uh, loans that are very risky, uh, package them up into securities, sell them under their reputation for you know, good, sound banking to unsuspecting uh, investors, uh, sometimes with credit insurance of different types, backing them up. Uh, and so they can create many more loans and spread them around to a much greater extent than if they were forced to put those loans in their balance sheet. If, you, if a bank puts their loans, loans on a balance sheet, it has to monitor those loans, has to collect those loans, has to enforce those loans. Yes, balance sheet lending can go bad. Uh, the SNL crisis, savings and loan crisis is an example of that. But, but in general, balance sheet lending uh, with uh, pr appropriate capitalization and appropriate regulation is likely to be a lot sounder than securitization, where the banks think, oh, we've gotten rid of these loans. You know, They're not on our balance sheet. Who cares when they blow up? Because we won't be holding them. Now, what actually happens in securitization is the desire is for more deals and more fees. And when the, when the investors get saturated and don't want the loans anymore, the banks start putting them on their balance sheet. So in the 1920s, and particularly in the 2000s, uh, banks began to put a lot of bad stuff on their balance sheets when they couldn't sell it. And that's why they were in such trouble when, when the, when, when the uh, uh, booms uh, crashed. Uh, look at Greensill. Uh, this is today's headline. You know, Greensill uh, took these so-called supply chain finance uh, uh, liabilities. They were essentially accounts uh, payable by um, uh, by by greens by the uh, clients to uh, the suppliers of goods and services. Greensill took these things, packaged them up into bonds, sold them out to investors, got credit insurance to back them up, uh, and and by one report uh, created about 150 billion dollars of these liabilities for a bank uh, and a and a and a securities affiliate that maybe only had six or seven billion dollars or eight billion dollars of assets, uh, then the credit insurers pulled their insurance and the whole house of cards has come tumbling down. Now we don't know just what the reverberating effects are going to be, but to me, green cell is a is another object lesson of the of the dangers of allowing securities firms to affiliate or especially control banks uh, and, and the dangers of securitization. Um, secondly, um, Conflicts of interest, right? That that a, a bank that 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 creates securities to sell can no longer be an objective lender, can no longer be an objective investment advisor. Uh, they are creating loans to securitize market and sell. They're no longer interested in the long-term viability of those loans. Uh, they can't give objective investment advice because they're selling their own product. They're selling their own stuff. They're not an objective advisor. Uh, and these conflicts of interest, I think, cause enormous problems. And then there's a compensation issue. Uh, compensation for investment banks is an upfront business. You get, you get deal fees at the front end uh, and you collect your fees and walk away. 
And you're not really so interested as to whether the deal survives over the longer term. Yes, you can argue there are reputational concerns, but, reputa but, but deal fees are very uh, uh, seductive. Let me, let me just show you this slide. This shows what, in the United States what happened to compensation in the financial sector uh, during periods of universal banking versus uh, separation, uh, more, more regulation. You can see that in the 1920s and, and up to about 1930, compensation was very high. This, it was about 1.6 times the average compensation of other industrial sectors. As soon as you pass Glass-Steagall Act and separate banks from securities, uh, go through the depression, look at the, the compensation falls considerably. By the time you get to the 1960s and 70s, it's barely more than what normal people make in other sectors, uh, about the same. As soon as deregulation starts in 1980, and particularly after about 1988 or 89, when securitization begins, look at the skyrocketing of compensation in the financial sector, up to about 1.75 by the time the crisis comes along in 2007. These kinds of compensation structures create toxic incentives to take risk and to create more deals, more deals, more deals, more deals, no matter how risky they are. Um, also, in, in 1980, the average uh, financial executive was making about 10 times what the average senior financial regulator was making. By 2005, the average uh, senior financial executive was making 60 times what the average senior financial regulator was making. Of course, that creates a revolving door issue where uh, financial uh, regulators uh, are very tempted to go into the financial industry business. And if you want to go into the financial industry business, how tough are you going to be as a regulator? If you're a tough regulator, uh, the likely view is you're, you don't understand. You're not part of the club. You're a problem. You're not a team player. Uh, the tough regulators don't tend to be invited uh, through the revolving door. Um, lastly, putting banks and securities firms together uh, and other financial institutions, uh, you create these giant financial conglomerates. Uh, they're automatically too big to fail. Uh, what J.P. Morgan now is is uh, is around three trillion dollars. Nobody's going to allow J.P. Morgan to fail. Uh, many others are in the in the trillion or two trillion dollar range. Uh, so you have these two big to fail conglomerates. They are so complex, so opaque. Uh, nobody can understand them. Nobody can manage them, in my view. Nobody can regulate them effectively, and and so they become a law unto themselves. Uh, they're they're they they are required to be made fail proof. Uh, okay, one one last slide. We didn't change the financial system after the global financial crisis. We left universal banking alone. We thought we could regulate it better through a number of technical reforms, mainly on capital and liquidity. Um, I agree, more capital and liquidity was needed, but we didn't change any of the four problems that I just laid out for you. <laughs> Look how global debt has continued to grow. It was 225% of global GDP in, in, in 2000, 275% uh, in 2007. It was 320% uh, percent uh, in 2018 and 19, this past year, it's gone to 355% of GDP. We have this con this constant uh, uh, accumulation of more and more and more debt. Uh, this creates what I call a global doom loop. Uh, I don't want to to um, uh, go too too far past my extended time, but uh, perhaps in in response to questions, um, I I can talk more about this global doom loop. Why it is why it exists, why it has been, uh, in a sense, has been magnified by the pandemic crisis when we basically had, again, uh, a complete comprehensive set of bailouts for all financial institutions and markets, just like 2008. Um, and my, 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 my warning to all of you is I don't see how this is in any way sustainable. Um, we can talk about what happens when you get unsustainable debt burdens. But I think we're at that point. Uh, I think you're seeing evidence in the bond market in the United States that we're already at that point. Uh, and then we, then I'm sorry, we haven't gotten uh, yet to the FinTechs, but we can uh, also, I think Greensill is a FinTech. That's, that's certainly an example. Uh, we can talk about FinTechs. Wirecard is another one. Uh, we can talk about the dangers of FinTech and particularly allowing big technology firms 
uh, to acquire banks and create even larger <laughs> commercial uh, financial conglomerates. You know, it, if we've created all these problems with financial conglomerates, just imagine what problems we'll create if we allow even further conglomeration between uh, com commerce and finance. But I'll, I think I'll stop here and, and then uh, invite questions and we can, we can discuss uh, these issues further. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Art. This is really fascinating. I have many questions, and in my privilege as chair, I will ask the first one. And, and I take you on the last point, on the point of, the, of the, the digital revolution and the advent of, of what someone has classified as financial digital conglomerates, in right. which the digitalization and the financialization go hand in hand. And what do you think the law should do nationally and internationally to deal with those financial digital conglomerates? And also, how do you think that we can achieve coordination so that there is not uh, issues of regulatory arbitrage so if some jurisdiction adopts a, a more a cautious approach, other jurisdictions will eventually take advantage of what would, could be a, a race to the bottom in, in this particular field. So what do you think about that? Right. So I, th I think that, you know, the, the digitalization, it seems to me, is, is um, an improvement in data processing and data management. <laughs> and, and so that's an infrastructure issue. And I, I certainly think banks need that. Uh, banks need to be current uh, with data technology. Uh, I think that th that should be done through partnerships uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, procurement with data companies. But I don't see how I don't see why the digitalization or, or data revolution, you could say, the computer revolution, justifies allowing someone like a, an Amazon, a Google, a Facebook, a Apple. Microsoft. I don't see why it, 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 it justifies allowing them to acquire banks, because I think once you do that, uh, you're going to end up with something that looks like a a Alibaba and Ant Financial in China. And it's interesting, China has cracked down on Ant Financial and Alibaba because they discovered that this was uh, a, a, an organization that was essentially out of control. I mean, that had, had was creating enormous amounts of credit was ex was using its size and data control to exclude other competitors. So I I understand that you know if if you were working with Ant Financial and Alibaba, you couldn't use Tencent. Uh, if you were using Tencent, you couldn't use Alibaba and Ant Financial. And again, uh, I'm no expert on China, but it's interesting that China, which has much more of a command and control system, obviously decided this is dangerous. We shouldn't allow it to happen. Uh, I think that to allow these technology companies to get direct access to everyone's financial data on top of the data they have uh, would be, to me, very frightening. Now, now there would be no there would be no such thing as financial privacy any longer. Um, the other thing is, I think Wirecard is an is a really interesting example that th this was a supposedly a high technology company providing payment services. Uh, it controlled a bank uh, in Germany. It, it had something like a bank in England, but nobody understood what it was doing. And it was shuffling money around and creating credit that nobody understood. Uh, this is partly the problem of if you don't regulate the holding company and the affiliates. In other words, if you don't re if you don't regulate the entire family that surrounds a bank, inevitably th those that holding company, those affiliates will try to take advantage of the bank. You know, they'll use it as a piggy bank, quite literally. That's really what Wirecard did. That appears to be what Greensill has done. Also, Greensill was, again, a German bank, unregulated family of companies around it, again, using the bank as a piggy bank. So I think, you know, we, we I think, I hope we need to understand from these episodes that we need to keep a separation between commercial companies uh, and, and, and finance, and we need to have consolidated regulation of finance uh, so that banks are not uh, looted or, or abused by their affiliates and owners. Uh, of course, I would say that we really should have a separation between banks and capital markets so we aren't creating these too big to fail financial conglomerates. That let, let banks be banks, let them be the infrastructure, uh, deposit, payments, services, on balance sheet lending, uh, syndicated lending, I think we could, that would be all right. Uh, trust services, but 
have them be more confined. And then let's have the financial markets actually be markets. I, I, you know, basically in 2008, 20, uh, two times, uh, the, the, the Fed and the, the, the EU have basically bailed out the entire financial markets. At that point, they aren't really markets anymore. They're one-way bets, right? The, 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 the central banks and the governments are putting the floor under the markets and allowing investors to shoot the moon. That's an asymmetric risk curve that encourages more and more risk-taking. Uh, as we can discuss, in order to do that, governments have to be creating more and more debt uh, to infuse money into these markets and pump them up. But uh, I, I think at some point that, is, as we can discuss, becomes unsustainable. Thank you. There is a question, Kevin. Would you like to ask the question yourself? We cannot hear you if you unmute yourself. Oh, yes. Unmute your uh, microphone. Yeah. There we go. Uh uh, Professor, it's good to see you. Hi, uh, Kevin. How are you? Good. I'm just wondering if size alone is a urgent problem, or if it's only when combined with this toxic mix of commercial investment banking that size becomes a problem. Well, I think size is certainly an issue, and you know, one 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 uh, question I think that my my proposal doesn't answer is: let's say you separated banks from the capital markets. Um, that would certainly reduce the size of something like J.P. Morgan Chase or uh, Barclays considerably. Um, the question that would then become, if banks were forced to be traditional banks, could they maintain still a very large size? Um, I tend to think without the advantages of too big to fail status and without the advantages of essentially the, 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 the securities franchise, which is a free ride to me on the, de on the deposit insurance uh, in the too big to fail system, if they could no longer make these super profits from capital markets activities, I, I tend to think they would be forced to shrink. That, 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 uh, I, I don't think that a, that a trillion dollar bank is really better than a $200 billion bank or a $100 billion bank. And I think they would be forced to shrink. Now, if they aren't, you know, your, your question is, is still relevant because if a bank is a, billion, is a trillion dollars or even 800 billion, it's probably still too big to fail. So I would say, let's take the first step of separating banks from the capital markets. If they still remain too large and the too big to fail uh, problem is still there, then you may want to take further steps to actually reduce the size of the banks. I'm hoping that, that this, the steps I'm proposing would create a more competitive more decentralized in terms of not so few giant institutions, more dynamic system. But I, I have to admit that, that that's yet to be shown. Yeah. And then, of course, we have, a, you know, in the too big to fail, as, as people say, there is the two parts, is the too big and the to fail, the role that competition will have in future. So we are right. talking right. about on the one hand regulation, but you know, competition obviously has a fundamental role to play, and that's something that can be explored further. Indeed, in the U.S. in the past, there were, you know, important size limits with the interstate branching and interstate. Yes, yes. So that's something that can be perhaps explored again uh, related to your question. You wanted to say something else, Kevin? Yes, I just had a follow-up. I, I just wonder whether the antitrust laws can be effective to, uh, to police these problems. I think we. I think they could be. We would have to really do some important new work on them. Uh, for example, uh, the, at the moment in the United States, antitrust only looks at local markets and doesn't look at regional and national markets, which is certainly, I think, not appropriate. And they also don't look at individual business lines. So, if you looked at, for example, something like syndicated lending as a separate business line, you might be very concerned about very large banks controlling that market. Um, so I think a better definition of, of what's the appropriate geographic market, what's the appropriate product market would certainly be very helpful. Now, Dodd-Frank did one thing we, we haven't seen yet, which is it put in systemic risk as a factor in deciding to turn down a bank merger, that the merged combined bank would greatly increase systemic risk and shouldn't be permit, permitted on that ground. Uh, so far, they haven't turned down any merger based on systemic risk, and there have been a couple of pretty good-sized mergers since then. Um, so I think the systemic risk factor, if it were made important, could be helpful, but it, it hasn't been operationalized yet. Thank you for that interesting question, or two questions, as, as well as, as the answers.
We have here another question by Brandon. Brandon, you want to show yourself? He's asking- no, Unmute your phone, yeah, your microphone, yes. Thank you, sorry. Um, yeah, I just wondered, um, have you looked at whether the US, and come to that, the EU, but probably more in your case, the US, uh, should look at imposing a form of ring fencing on the banking system, same as the UK has? <laughs> yes, I looked. I mean, the, the, the ring fencing system that the UK has, as I understand it, is actually quite similar to uh, the existing United States Bank Holding Company Act uh, in its affiliate transaction rules. In other words, as I understand the ring fencing, which I think was a good step forward for the UK, uh, it requires, uh, as you say, the securities affiliates, uh, capital markets affiliates, uh, to be separate from retail banking. Uh, that is also true in the United States, that, that they have to be separate affiliates. Uh, another question is, well, what kind of a transactions are permitted between them? Uh, is a, in the United States, something called uh, Sections 23A and 23B of the Federal Reserve Act do put restrictions on affiliate transactions, particularly loans and extensions of credit between the bank and the securities affiliates. I gather that, the, the, that it's quite similar in the, in, in the UK. The problem is it's not an absolute prohibition. So you could do something called narrow banking, uh, which uh, I think John Vickers had proposed, which basically would say there could be no transfers of funds at all between the bank and the capital markets affiliates. The, the bank could pay dividends to the holding company, but that's all. They couldn't provide any transfers of funds to help out the affiliates. That kind of you know, really uh, hermetically sealing of the bank was not done in, in the ring fencing legislation, nor is it true in the United States. What we've heard, what we've experienced in the United States is that when crises come, and this was certainly true in 2007 and 8, the Federal Reserve waived, in other words, released all these affiliate transaction rules to allow the banks to support their capital markets affiliates. So essentially the firewalls were taken down when the fire started. Um, and so I worry that unless you have really absolute rules saying there's no cross subsidization from the banks to the capital markets affiliates, then when the crisis comes, uh, you know, the, 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 the regulator says, OK, banks, help out your affiliates and bail them out, which really means that there really wasn't a firewall. Um, obviously, a, a new Glass-Steagall would say they can't even be under common ownership. So that creates essentially uh, a very strict firewall by saying you can't commonly own. Uh, a bank could make an arm's length loan, but then then there would be no temptation to bail out your sister company because you wouldn't be uh, there'd be no parent company anymore. Um, so I think ring fencing is not a bad idea, but I worry about whether it's strong enough and whether it would hold up during a crisis. I mean, Rosa, I'm sure knows more about ring fencing than I do, and I would certainly invite her her views on this. Thank you. Indeed, a ring fencing is certainly a, a solution that in the UK it has, however, been criticized. Part of my question to you was: This is your regulatory arbitrage. You know, if other jurisdictions do not follow, are we putting ourselves at the disadvantage? Which I guess in a highly competitive world that we still yes. have is obviously an issue. I think overall it is a, a, a fair attempt at de-risking part of the banking business and not using the funding of deposits for the, the more uh, risky parts of the banking business. So in that right. sense, I think it's, it's a good solution, but it's, I wouldn't say it's perfect, it's just a step forward. And obviously it has- It's really better than, than certainly having them all kind of commingled together with no separation by corporation, right? Exactly, exactly. Mm. There is here another question. This goes on the digitalization. And this question is from Gian Piero. Gian Piero, you want to ask the question yourself? Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, it's a, it's a great pleasure to be invited to such an interesting event. Um, a question on, on, I mean, you touched on many issues, so I mean, the discussion can go forever. But I was, uh, I was very interested about the, the aspects on digitalization and you mentioned about the partnership between fintechs and banks, which, of course, I mean, one of, it's one of the new uh, evolution that we see, of course, open banking, mobile banking, and the fintech world. Now, <clears throat> I have two questions, if I may. Um, so we see the banking platform, banking platform and the partnership between fintech and banks are being created, but also to use uh, the data for credit purposes. So we see a sort of movement from using collaterals to the provision of credit 
to the profiling. And this profiling, of course, raises a number of issues in terms of uh, capital adequacy. So the first question is, how can we really regulate the banking business to be sound when we have a, a completely different credit methodology? Um, and then the second part of the question is, uh, can the business model of adding blockchain technology to mortgages, I don't know if you, if you are familiar, I mean, I'm following uh, provenance and the hash system, so that they actually, that linking block, uh, blockchain technology to new mortgages, can, can this system solve the problem that we have seen in the last crisis, especially in pricing uh, ABS and CDOs? Can this be a solution for better pricing of securities and therefore be, be allowing more confidence in capital requirements? Thank you. Thank you, Ian Piero. Y yeah, so I think the, the, um, uh, the first question, which is how do you assess credit, you know, under a digital profile as opposed to traditional uh, notions of either character lending, you, you know the person, uh, you know their background, they've dealt with you. You, 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 for example, you can observe what they're doing in their deposit accounts uh, versus, no, this is just simply uh, kind of a, an algorithm based upon, you know, the, the data that's available on the, on, on the, the World Wide Web. Um, I agree with you. I think there are two problems. One is, you know, to what extent is data really reliable? Uh, you know, people can manipulate data and data changes quickly. Um, so I'm not uh, I, I'm not necessarily a believer that uh, data you know that the idea of data solves all problems um, because uh, like everything else it's as good as the system that manages it and it's as good as the the coding and 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 construction that is done uh, certainly many you know credit scoring which was really a, a, an earlier version of this you know credit scoring has been proven to be helpful but but not foolproof uh, credit scores can be manipulated the the converse problem is that by using algorithms of data um, are you actually discriminating right against people that don't fit the algorithm so how is the algorithm constructed does it does it disfavor certain for example uh, historically underrepresented groups that haven't had a lot of wealth or a lot of opportunity to build wealth uh, or don't have the conventional you know educational background. Uh, so that's a very tricky thing because certainly discrimination in lending is a, is a, is a big problem on both sides of the Atlantic and, and uh, how these algorithms will do it, I think is, is, is not yet you know, proven. So my view is it's, it's a work in progress. I think it could certainly be an adjunct to credit scoring, that kind of methodology, but I don't think it's foolproof. And I agree with you that it could be misused and it could be, a, could be unreliable. Um, the second point about blockchain, I, I confess not to be an expert on blockchain and, and not even perhaps even uh, uh, an educated amateur on blockchain, but, but let me give my understanding of, of blockchain in, 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 in a couple sentences. My understanding, it's a system where it's an uncurated system whereby anybody who you know, somehow has membership in the system can add things to the system and nobody can take it away. Uh, that's an interesting system. It strikes me as very complex and uh, to some extent unwieldy. Now, some people have talked to me about, have said there's such a thing as curated blockchain, which means somebody in the system is managing what goes in and what comes out, what gets rejected. Uh, if I could draw an analogy to Wikipedia, you know, it, there's an editor on Wikipedia that can sort of take stuff out if they don't like it. Uh, to me, blockchain is sort of like a Wikipedia without an editor if in, in the purest form. So I, I, I'd have to sort of understand how that could work in a system like mortgages, which is such a huge system. I can understand how it might work, for example, in very large sovereign payments or maybe even syndicated lending where you have a fairly small number of participants. I think what you're, what you're asking is, uh, I'm, I'm sort of the underlying notion of your question is, can you make this blockchain more reliable uh, so that you don't have a breakdown in title. What we actually had in the United States was we, we had something called the, the Mortgage Electronic Registration System, the MERS system created by the big banks, uh, which did not track the actual real estate title recording systems in the state and local jurisdictions. So these mortgages were being transferred electronically, but the transfers are not actually recorded 
in the land records of the appropriate jurisdiction. So in many cases, it was very hard to prove you know, who owned the mortgages when the mortgages defaulted or who had the rights to enforce them. Um, so now maybe if blockchain yes, is, is, is better than I think it is, you could use that as a verifying system without having to make all these land record uh, updates. But uh, the MERS system would indicate beware, right, that you can create a system that doesn't co doesn't correlate uh, with traditional systems of land records. And then how do you how do you deal with the gaps, right? When the, when the land record system is not the same as your electronic or digital system, what happens then? In the United States, it was a disaster. I mean, sort of the MERS system was kind of upheld, but it caused enormous problems. And I don't know that those actually, the, whether the problems have been fixed. I, I, I'm not totally up to date on that point, but, it's a, but the MERS system strikes me as at least a cautionary example. Thank you very much. We have another question here from Francesca Arnold Dwyer, and she asked me to read it to you because she has bad connection. Uh, she's interested in banks selling and buying CDS protection, yes. uh, overlap with insurance and insurance products, and the safeguards against the empty creditor problem manufactured credit events. And she asks, should there be more separation and transparency? Yes. Uh, so this, this is really a problem in a sense of breaking down the, sep the historic separation between banking and insurance, right? That the, the banks were allowed to create CDS, credit default swaps, which essentially were synthetic insurance. Um, and, uh, you know, until Dodd-Frank Act, nobody knew how many CDS there were uh, and who held them. Uh, I've heard varying, varying uh, estimates. There might have been, you know, 10 or $15 trillion of CDS, you know, related to subprime securities, uh, which created sort of a, a pyramid of bets based upon a, 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 about $3 trillion worth of subprime mortgages. And so when the mortgages began to default, you had a cascading effect with the whole pyramid collapsing. Now, Dodd-Frank uh, at least uh, tried to bring more of these instruments onto clearing platforms uh, so that, that there would be some understanding of, you know, how these things are traded and who owns them. Uh, but there's still a problem. Uh, it, with insurance, uh, you, have to, you have to own the asset you insure. Uh, you may not bet on your neighbor's house or your neighbor's car for uh, understandable reasons because that creates <laughs> perverse incentives. You might insure your neighbor's house and then burn it down, right? You might insure your neighbor's car and then make sure it crashes uh, so you can collect. Uh, insurance, traditional insurance won't allow you to do that. Credit default swaps, unfortunately, will. They allow you to bet on somebody else's property. That's the so-called insurable, insurable interest problem. Um, I still don't know why that's a good system. Why, why do we allow multiple bets on somebody else's property, at least without very strong regulation? Uh, we have more transparency, but I'm not sure that that's sufficient. The other problem is... Uh, with insurance, you have to maintain reserves against uh, the insurance you write. Um, credit default swaps, uh, until Dodd-Frank, there, no, there were no reserve requirements. Um, now, it is true with the Dodd-Frank requirements, you're supposed to create margin um, when you clear them, or if you don't clear them, you have to create margin. So the margin requirements are an improvement, but again, the question becomes, uh, are the margin requirements sufficient to avoid a crash and a, and a crisis? Now, again, uh, Greensill, what happened there was that the credit insurers refused to extend the credit any longer, the credit insurance, Tokyo Marine among them. Uh, Greensill sued the, the credit insurance companies in Australia and lost. Um, but it'll be interesting to see whether, whether uh, credit insurance becomes an issue in, in Greensill. Uh, I think it... Uh, it's interesting that that insurance turns out to be the weak, weak link in Greensill. It was certainly a major weak link during the global financial crisis, AIG being the classic example. Uh, I think it does remind us that banking, securities, and insurance have very traditionally well-defined and different functions and different regulatory approaches. And I think this idea that we can somehow just homogenize them and combine them all together, I, th I think that that 
uh, again, I'm a very traditional person, as you can now understand, but I think sort of disposing of these traditional understandings of the different functions of different financial instruments, I think is a mistake. I think homogenizing is, in my view, not always a good idea. Yeah. I hope that's responsive to the question. No, I think that's excellent. Thank you very much. There is still a couple of questions. One is uh, with regard to the asset purchases of the Fed during the pandemic or in the response. Yes, the I'm glad that question's coming. Yes. Yeah, one of the issues, well, there are many issues about that, and you can talk as many issues as you wish, but there is the issue there uh, of, of on, the, on the one hand, markets not behaving as markets, but uh, yes. and then there is the issue of codependency between the central bank yes. and the financial market. Yes. There is the issue of the decoupling of the economy, and there is also the issue of compensation, you know, in which, you know, yes. some of the this is the global doom loop that I was discussing. So, if you want to talk a little bit more about that, I think that's an important yes. aspect. I finished the book in January of 2020, uh, before the, the, the pandemic struck. Uh, and when the pandemic struck, uh, I thought, oh, this is going to be interesting to see whether my book, you know, has anything to say about it uh, or is disproven by it. Well, I mean, again, I'm, I'm trying not to <laughs> claim too much for it, but I think that, that my sense is the pandemic crisis proved exactly what I said about the, the, the global doom loop. What is the global doom loop? Well, it, it, in, in my view, it is that you have this collection of very large, too big to fail uh, bank financial conglomerates. And you also have a very large collection of, of large shadow banks. What are shadow banks? Essentially, they are unregulated financial institutions that are, are mimicking, pretending to be banks without being banks. Uh, they're allowed to, to issue things like money market mutual funds. They're allowed to issue things like short-term repos, which are simply deposits in disguise. Uh, these are short-term financial instruments uh, in which promises are being made to repay people at par. Those are deposits. So my proposal says I would prohibit any of those people from issuing any paper with less than a 91 day term that was payable at par and demand. And my view is if, if you didn't allow any repos or any money market funds to be issued by anything other than banks, um, pretty quickly the shadow market, the shadow banking market would shrink very substantially because they, they would have to fund themselves at longer terms with more market discipline. Okay, so, but, we, but right now we have these two systems, big banking, shadow banking, and they're creating a lot of debt, they're creating a lot of risk, and they get into trouble. What happens when they get into trouble? The governments rush in and provide recapitalization, asset debt guarantees, uh, stimulus funds to prop up the economy, and the central banks rush in um, and buy up the government bonds that are being created to, to do the bailouts and to do the stimulus. Uh, and, and they also buy up mortgage bonds and other long-term securities to suppress interest rates and keep borrowing costs low. But by doing that, by keeping borrowing costs low, first of all, they make it cheap to issue more debt for both governments and private sector. And second, they encourage investors to reach for yield. The investors can't make any real money holding traditional safe debt, either government debt or you know, blue chip corporate debt. So they start reaching into risky stuff, either risky high yield debt uh, or risky stocks. So now you have investors, again, this is the asymmetric risk curve. There's a floor created by the governments and central banks. They shoot the moon. And then when the crash comes, the government has to, has to do the same thing again. If they allow the, the market to collapse, then banks are going to fail and these shadow banks are going to fail. And you're going to have uh, either a Great Depression or at least a, global, a, Lehman, uh, a Lehman episode, which they don't want. So what do they do with the pandemic crisis? Um, Governments have authorized about $13 trillion of stimulus payments. Central bank balance sheets of the, of the big four, uh, not counting China, uh, the US, EU, UK, Bank of Japan, uh, those balance sheets have increased by $9 trillion. Uh, worldwide debt this last year increased by $24 trillion, uh, almost not, uh, over 9%. <laughs> uh, so now you have this sort of incredible kind of uh, doubling down on this continued loop of more risk, more debt, more intervention, more propping up. And my view is that can't go on forever, right? At some point, 
people will no longer trust the credibility of the government bonds that are being issued. Now in Japan, what they do is basically the Bank of Japan buys up you know, most of the government debt, but how long can that go on? Uh, I think you're hearing in the bond markets today in the United States in particular, and I gather also over in Europe, the bond markets are getting nervous, like, wait a minute, uh, we're, we're not willing to buy more government debt unless they raise the yield, right? Unless they raise interest rates. If they raise interest rates, that's going to cause tremendous strain on both the debt burden and on the economy, and it could cause a, a sort of a, a, a fall back into recession. How are we going to break this loop? I don't think we're going to break it by maintaining the existing system. Could we see inflation? I believe we could. Historically, when, when debt burdens become unsustainable, basically one of three things happens. One is you have a default, which would be catastrophic. You have an official devaluation, which happened in the 1930s when the countries went off the gold standard. The United States, for example, devalued by about 65%. I think Britain, something very similar when they went off the gold standard. Uh, or you have you, inflation, which is an implicit devaluation. Um, the World War I debts were solved with defaults and devaluations. The World War II debts were basically dealt with through inflation. We now have the highest level of debt, government sovereign debt since World War II on, on both a national US basis, I think UK also, and globally. How is that debt gonna be handled? As I say, default, devaluation, or inflation, those are, those are really, <laughs> damaging, you know, dangerous things. And my, you know, the people who claim we can keep the system going forever, I, I, I'm, I'm, I again, I admit to be an old fashioned guy, but I lived through the inflation of the, the, the 70s and early 80s. And I, I don't want to repeat it, but I'm afraid we're headed to another one. With that uh, very hopeful note. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we are going to say uh, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. There are more questions in the chat room. A couple of them are quite good, so I will send them to you by email. Thank but you. our session is finishing now. And I really, I mean, just by the sheer number of questions in the, in the chat room, it just shows what an interest your presentation has generated and what a timely debate this is really, not just obviously for your book and obviously your, the promotion of it is something I'm sure your publishers want, but the debate more generally and more broadly, since this issue is very important for the, for the future of and the welfare of our society. So I thank you on behalf of CCLS, Center for Commercial Law Studies and the London Financial Regulation Seminar, which I run together with Charles Goodhart and Jeffrey Wood and others. And it's always a pleasure to listen to your ideas. And this has been a very, a provocative and insightful presentation. And so we all thank you very much. We, if, if we were in person, we will do clapping. These days, the students, they put the emoji claps on the, on the chat room. So thank you very much, Art. This was masterful, and I look forward to catching up with you soon. Thank you, Rose, and thank you, everyone. Enjoyed it very much. Thank you for your attention.